that the investigating judges have identified, and I shall be very brief, uh, uh, consistent with what my learned friend has just submitted to you. So evidence of linkage between the crimes committed by his subordinates to his role at the Standing Committee. Uh, uh, Again, Your Honor, that, that, we're back to where I just stated. And I would like a ruling from the trial chamber. I mean, the trial chamber was very quick to interrupt me and to ask me the relevance. I, in this case, I objected, and he indicated that he would move on, and then he went right back to where he's at. And we can play this cat and mouse game all day long, but I would like a ruling from the trial chamber as to whether he's allowed to go into the specifics, whether they're headings, but he's drawing conclusions of what's in the facts, and he's talking about a mode of liability which this pretrial chamber declined to, to, to rule on and which is before uh, the trial chamber in another case. And I'm referring to the joint criminal enterprise. May I ask uh, the co-prosecutor, uh, without a ruling, uh, as you have just uh, uh, explained to the court that you would continue uh, with, uh, in accordance with the uh, remarks made by the... Uh, I shall do so, Your Honor. Uh, once again, just two other points. Jurisdictional requirements. Crimes against humanity have jurisdictional requirements that we have to prove that it was part of systematic and widespread nature. The investigating judges are collecting evidence to that. Uh, nature. Conspiracy, we, are, we have said it's part of public knowledge that there was a conspiracy. Investigating judges are collecting evidence in respect of conspiracy that this accused, this charge person was part of a wider conspiracy. Forensic evidence, evidence to establish the existence of the crimes and they occurred and, 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 and people who uh, committed those crimes is also being collected by the investigating judges. Therefore, my respectful submission is that evidence of a wide variety of nature is being collected and it's, it's, it's not appropriate to say that if, an, if a defense, if a witness statement doesn't name a particular charged person, it's not relevant to his case because relevance should be seen in the light of these five heads that I submitted before Your Honor. Investigative requests have been filed by various charged persons. Uh, uh, my learned friend has filed his first investigative request only about 10 to 12 days ago. My learned friend has not brought uh, to uh, the prosecution's awareness any exculpatory evidence on the case file for the investigating judges to rule otherwise that well-founded reasons do not exist to believe uh, exist to believe that this charged person may not have committed uh, those crimes for which he's being charged. Therefore, I finish if my I may, argument If I may interrupt the... again, Your Honor, and now we're going into confidential matters. And I don't want to bring in the issue of when I was flying back last time, the investigative judges had a very public announcement about holding the defense lawyers in contempt, essentially, for disclosing confidential matters. Now the gentleman is going into investigative requests that we made that were filed uh, as confidential. As confidential. And the gentleman knows. And now he's discussing them publicly. And I do believe what's good for the defense is good for the prosecution. And for him to say what the court investigative judges are doing is not enough uh, concerning our argument of due diligence or whether the evidence is relevant or not. We never raised the issue of relevance. But I do believe that he should not be allowed to go into pleadings that were filed confidential, con confidentially and the contents of which are confidential based on jurisprudence or rulings or, or the rules of this uh, institution. And he shouldn't be allowed to do that because then I have to respond. And if I have to respond, I have to go into confidential matters. Your Honor, uh, I shall just submit what was part of our appeal that my learned friend has not brought any exculpatory evidence onto the case file to the awareness of the prosecution. And this was part of our appeal response, which is a public document uh, as uh, released by, my, uh, by your Honours. I'll then just go over to the question of house arrest without taking too much of your time. My learned friend has already referred to that matter. And just draw your attention in particular response to my learned friend's arguments in his appeal response, whether house arrest in the facts and circumstances of this case is an appropriate measure. And once again, I shall be very brief and I can even conclude before your honors adjourn for lunch. And my submission is the question of house arrest and the so-called hospital detention, as mentioned by my learned friend, was discussed by your honors. It was raised by my learned friend in his first appeal against original detention, and it was dismissed by this honorable court. It was dismissed in your order of the 17th of October on two issues. The first issue was hospital detention, your honors held, uh, was a matter to be determined by doctors, as in when 
doctors have decided this church person has gone to the Calumet Hospital with which this uh, court has a special agreement. So doctors shall determine whether this person should be sent to the hospital or not. It's not a matter for judicial adjudication. So your honors have clearly dealt with that matter. And facts and circumstances remain the same. Material circumstances have not changed. And therefore, the investigating judges had no reason to go into that question and decide otherwise. On the question of house arrest, your honors had a very elaborate uh, discussion of the question of house arrest and were convinced on the 17th of October that house arrest was not an appropriate measure. The investigating judges, relying quite appropriately on a ruling of an appellate court just about 15 days before they decided, they uh, felt convinced that house arrest was not an appropriate measure. Therefore, my learned friend's argument that the investigating judges did not provide elaborate reasoning to agree with your honors uh, would therefore not hold too much water, most respectfully. I would submit, and your honors, uh, just to recap what your honors held on the 17th of October, your honors said in paragraph 119 of your honors order, the internal rules and the CPC, the Cambodian Criminal Procedure Court, do not provide for an alternative means of detention. The internal rules your honors held only provide for detention in this detention facility. Your Honor also felt, however, that there was an argument of bail. It could be raised under 65-1. But Your Honor said that if conditions necessitating detention under 63-3B are satisfied, there was no condition of a bail. And Your Honor consequently held that those three conditions, as my learned friend mentioned, C, uh, 3, 4, and 5 of 63, 3B remained satisfied, and therefore your honors extended the detention and denied the request for house arrest. And we most respectfully submit that the conditions in which house arrest is not an appropriate measure remain satisfied. My learned friend in his appeal mentioned certain decisions of one international tribunal, the ICTY, which is in its early years granted so-called house arrest to one or two of its accused. That happened with most uh, respect in the early years of that tribunal, in the early 90s when that tribunal was established, mid 90s when that tribunal was established, and thereafter the practice of that court uh, has not been in respect of granting more house arrest. For example, my learned friend has cited the case of Blaskic, who in 1996 uh, was the subject of an application for house arrest, and in which I may draw your attention to the Blaskic decision, in which the ICTY held that four conditions need to be satisfied, or at least need to be considered by a court when house arrest is to be determined. And these four conditions are very appropriately and properly uh, 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 paraphrased there. There must be no evidence that the defendant will escape, number one. Number two, there must be no likelihood that the defendant will tamper with evidence or witnesses. Number three, there must be no likelihood of continued criminality and, and I stress on that word, and, there must be no threat to peace and security. And all these conditions have to be satisfied for a court to be convinced that house arrest, if at all appropriate, should be ordered in this case. In our most respectful submission, most particularly, the last argument that there may be threat to peace and security is not satisfied, as your honors have held on the 17th of October, as confirmed by the investigating judges, and therefore uh, investigating uh, judges were right in not declaring uh, house arrest. My learned friend's client has very clearly told the investigating judges when he was brought before them for statutory interview in respect of detention conditions, excuse me, uh, that he found no particular problems, and, and I, I say with some sense of responsibility in respect of detention. And I'm just quoting directly from two interviews of this charge person. One interview was considered by your honors uh, when you decided the 17th of October um, appeal, and I'll not uh, dwell on that because that's a matter that's been determined. But just to tell your honors that on the 2nd of May, the only complaint that my learned friend's client was that he was getting food which was slightly fatty, which was pork, and therefore the food should be changed. 
He said to the investigating judges that the administration has accepted that his daughter can bring frozen fruit to him, that he also recognized that a male nurse visited him every day, that if he has a problem, he can call a doctor immediately, and he gets both Khmer and French doctors, and that he, know he did not need any medical care abroad. Same kind of interview happened on the 12th of December. That's after the filing of the appeal, just two days after the filing of the appeal, when my learned friend, Mr. Carnovas, appeared with the charge person before the investigating judges and said this, and the prosecution was not present there. He said, concerning detention condition, and Mr. Khan was speaking here, my client already made remarks on food given to him. He did not like pork because apparently it was fatty. He does not eat pork because it is fatty. Other than the food, we have no comments on detention conditions. And your honors recognized this in the order of the 23rd of February, uh, dismissing an application for calling a doctor's uh, uh, um, to depose in this oral hearing. Therefore, I would respectfully submit that your honors have held that the ECC detention facility is appropriately uh, equipped. And as my learned friend submitted, it's been internationally vetted by the ICRC. And, and therefore, uh, no cause arises for any other form of detention than detention uh, in this uh, facility. Uh, I have one more issue, and, and that was, and this is subject to my learned friend's objection, because this was a matter that we brought before the investigating judges to put on the case file. They determined that this did not arise in respect of the facts they were investigating. However, they did rule that this was a public report that was issued by a very respected university, the University of Berkeley, in respect of the perception of the court and the threats that the ordinary people of Cambodia felt uh, from the charged persons, either charged here or other people associated with the former Khmer Rouge. And with the honors leave, I've given a copy to my learned friend. I would re refer to that report, and I have a Khmer copy, although this is only in English. Just one paragraph of that report, and uh, I'd request the, the court officer to bring it to your honors' attention. Uh, it's already been provided. It's a report issued by the University of Berkeley and this happened after we filed our appeal response. Uh, we filed our appeal response in early January, and this report came out on the 21st of February. Just one paragraph from this report, Your Honor, and that will uh, end my arguments. But if it has to do with threats to witnesses or tampering with evidence, I would object to reading even that one paragraph, because I don't know exactly which paragraph the gentleman wishes I shall to confer to. Just read it and then make my submission, and if my learned friend wishes to object yeah. on my I'm submission. I'm objecting on the issue. grounds that that's not part of this appeal process. That wasn't the part of the findings of the OCIJ. And if you can point to where in the decision they also indicated that Mr. Sri posed a threat to witnesses and that he was going to be destroying evidence, very well. But if the, the gentleman could just please tell us whether the, the section that he's referring to in this report goes to that aspect. Because if it does, I object. If it goes to public peace and order, he's already made his, uh, his, his argument, and I have no objections to him reading something from a report. Your Honor, it, in our respectful submission, pertains to the question of public order, that it shall be disturbed if these accused, these church persons before you are released. Uh, and I must uh, submit that the investigating judges left a window open for us to say that if it's a public document, it can be raised in proceedings either before them or before the trial chamber, of course, with the leave of that particular chamber. And I've got the relevant paragraph translated into Khmer, uh, and I'm reading from page 29 of this document, Your Honours, the top paragraph on page 29. And this was a survey done throughout the country and with a sample that is representative of the population of this country. Um, and with most, uh, my submission, the honor, is just to uh, uh, take this on record. Four out of five respondents in our survey said that they harbored feelings of animosity towards those Khmer Rouge members who were responsible for violent acts. 71% said they wanted to see them suffer in some way. A third said they wished they could take revenge against the former Khmer Rouge and that they could do so if they had the opportunity. 
However, one third of the respondents said that they had forgiven the Khmer Rouge. Feelings of hatred were more frequent amongst those who lived under the Khmer Rouge regime compared to those who did not. Likewise, forgiveness was less frequent among those who lived under the Khmer Rouge regime compared to those who did not. My respectful submission is that when a majority of people feel threatened by or, or, or have strong feelings against the people associated with the Khmer Rouge and the crimes of the Khmer Rouge, it may disturb public order if these persons who are directly related to those crimes in the prosecution submission and those who are at least publicly identified as related to those crimes are released by your honorable court or this court. So most respectfully, I would submit that there is no material change in circumstance since your honors passed that order of the 17th of October and the investigating judges confirmed the order on the 10th of November for your honors to uh, revisit the conditions of detention. And in any case, my learned friend has not identified those material change in circumstance. Uh, and I would uh, close my arguments there, subject to any questions that the court may have. Just before the president will close uh, for uh, lunch, uh, I would like to make a remark uh, related uh, to the objection uh, that uh, of the multiple uh, objections uh, raised by the co-lawyers. Um, I would like to uh, uh, make clear that uh, the schedule of the pre-trial chamber contains a possibility of a partly in-camera hearing. So if there's any need uh, to uh, address confidential matters, I would like uh, to invite uh, the co-lawyers to make this known uh, to the greffier and then uh, the last, uh, last part of the hearing will be in camera. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Honours. We, we do not intend to be seeking at this point an in-camera hearing. The President, the Chamber will now adjourn for lunch and will resume at 1.30 p.m. Graffy, all rise.